Hi, this is Mark Birch, and the following should give you the structure in order to be able to do a top grade response. And today I'm going to be taking a look at how Shakespeare presents Lady Macbeth in the play. Having read Macbeth's letter in Act 1, Scene 5, Lady Macbeth demonstrates her evil by criticising Macbeth's kindness. She says that she will use the valour of my tongue in order to persuade him to commit an evil act. She demonstrates her sense of her own power by the use of the term my battlements. It's not Macbeth's battlements, it's not even our battlements, my battlements, with that possessive determiner showing that she's defying the conventions of a patriarchal society in terms of holding the reins of power herself. Trafficking with the supernatural would reinforce the perception of Lady Macbeth as evil. She goes on to seek the spirit's help in removing all her female qualities, unsex me here, wanting to be untroubled by compassion or guilt or any other female quality that might deter her from being able to deal with the awful acts that she's proposing. The different characteristics between Macbeth and Lady Macbeth are evident in their different forms of greeting. Macbeth seems to genuinely love his wife. He greets her with my dearest love, while she greets him with the joy of recognising the power of his new titles, both present and future, illustrating her ambition and lust for power. Great glams, worthy quarter, greater than both. Again, in contrast to Macbeth, Lady Macbeth exhibits absolutely no doubt whatsoever in regard to the murder of Duncan. She says, oh, never shall son that morrow see. Lady Macbeth's controlling and deceitful, ordering Macbeth to deceive by beguiling the time and looking like the innocent flower, uh, frequently using imperatives in order to convey these uh, commands, and showing her authority by using modal verbs like shall to demonstrate her authority, as well as the possessive pronoun my for her dispatch. Lady Macbeth's deceitful nature is also demonstrated by the way in which Shakespeare juxtaposes Act 1, Scene 5 of Act 1, Scene 6. We have her plan to murder Duncan juxtaposed to her flattery of Duncan. The dramatic irony created by this juxtaposition allows the audience to appreciate her level of deceit. The manipulative nature of Lady Macbeth is evident in Act 1, Scene 7 when she questions Macbeth's bravery, love and masculinity in order to persuade him to commit regicide. Act 1, Scene 7 reveals Lady Macbeth's merciless resolve, as she describes how she would have dashed her own baby's brains out if she had sworn to do something as Macbeth has done. And Macbeth concludes by saying that undaunted metal should compose nothing but males, as he recognises how merciless she is. Lady Macbeth's authoritative and adopts a leadership role. She plans the elements of the murder, stating his two chamberlains will eye with wine and wassail so convinced, and she executes these stages in Act 2, Scene 2, even returning the daggers. Again in Act 2, Scene 2, Lady Macbeth's practicality is evident. She says a foolish thought to say a sorry sight, and consider it not so deeply, even going so far as saying a little water clears us of this deed. When Lady Macbeth returns to the action in Act 3, Scene 2, she's undergone a profound change. She now experiences discontent and regret through the parallelism noughts had all spent. And there's an uncertainty and loss of power. She begins with an interrogative, what's to be done? Asking Macbeth, and Macbeth keeps her in ignorance, be innocent of the knowledge, dearest Chuck. Rolls reverse once again in the banquet scene, with Lady Macbeth taking control once Macbeth has lost it. Her skillful deceit is employed in an effort to limit the damage caused by Macbeth. Uh, she criticises Macbeth's bravery once again, and his manhood. Lady Macbeth's absent from most of the rest of the play. Her power, control and strength have been lost, and Shakespeare represents this by failing to represent her in the play. And finally, in the uh, sleepwalking scene of Act 5, Scene 1, we have the motif of disturbed sleep. Now evident in Lady Macbeth, she's overcome by guilt despite summoning the spirits to unsex her in Act 1, Scene 5. Here she says, out damned spot, in contrast to Act 2, Scene 2, where it was a little water clears us of this deed. Will these hands ne'er be clean links intertextually to Act 2, Scene 2 with Macbeth's Will all great Neptune's ocean wash this blood clean from my hand? No. This is also directly comparable to Lady Macbeth's hyperbole All the perfumes of Arabia will not sweeten this little hand. In terms of guilt, Lady Macbeth and Macbeth have reversed their roles. Lady Macbeth's insignificance is illustrated by this being her final appearance on the stage, leaving only a reference to her death and an allusion to her taking her own life in Act 5, Scene 9. Uh, where she's referred to as Macbeth's fiend-like queen. Okay, ta. For the close analysis required to flesh out this framework, please refer to the videos I've made on the specific scenes. Okay, ta.